Ephesians chapter 1 again. And Paul begins with his, his greeting. Paul, an apostle of, of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. So this is Paul greeting the church in Ephesus. And then, as was very, very common in, in those days with a letter, uh, you have this, um, this um, sort of um, very encouraging beginning. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, for, uh, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, as I said, Paul launches into this single um, sentence, uh, praise to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ shall be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Father, we just pray that you will open up your word to our hearts and to our minds this evening, that you will bless us, Lord, challenge us, meet our needs, correct our behaviour and attitude where it needs correcting. Encourage our hearts, Lord. Comfort us if we are grieving or going through difficulties. And may your word be to us, not what we want, but what we need. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. And Paul begins by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. And Paul was a, um, a man of, of great depth. A man who has given us some of the, the greatest teaching in the Bible and has given us so much of the New Testament. And Paul's writings are, are an encouragement, that, but they're also a, a warning um, to study the Word and not to be lightweight or... Um, unlearned in our study of the scripture. And when I say that we should be learned, what I mean is that we shouldn't be foolish. Paul's desire with every church was that they were to grow up, they were to mature in Jesus Christ. And I believe that should be every pastor's heart. Um, I believe that a pastor shouldn't preach and teach uh, wanting to necessarily be, be popular or wanting necessarily um, uh, you know, to uh, 
to, to receive praise. Um, but he should teach and he should preach. So that he would be able to, at the end of his ministry, present the church mature in Jesus Christ. And it's the maturity of the saints that is, is so important. And there's so much on Paul's heart. It is not God's will that we should look back 20, 30 years ago, two years ago, one year ago, five years ago, whatever, whatever it is, whatever, whenever you were saved, and look back on that, that date of salvation, and then look at the period of time up to today, without being able to say, I've really matured in God. I've really grown in the Lord. I've really grown in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should not look back and almost be embarrassed um, at the lack of growth in our Christian life. And don't get me wrong, you never get to that point where you actually feel that you have arrived. Paul, Paul used actually, the, the, in uh, Philippians, he actually used the term of, but I press on. Not, not that I have already arrived, but I press on towards the mark. And I think that, that Paul should be um, our example, our goal. Of course, Jesus is our goal, but Jesus is unreachable as a goal uh, in his body, on this earth, and with our sinful nature. But Paul we can identify with. And uh, Paul actually said, you know, follow me. Follow my example. Be like me. And yet this same Paul who says here, an apostle of Jesus Christ, said that he was the least of all the, the, the apostles. This Paul who says in, uh, in Rome, in the, you know, towards the end of Romans 7, a wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. But Paul was a man also who knew who, who he was in Jesus Christ. And uh, he's a very, very interesting um, man to, to make a study of from the book of Acts and also his letters. Because he says that he's the least of all the apostles he says that uh, he's a wretched man. He says he's the worst of sinners. And yet, he says, but be and follow my example. Be like me. Follow my example. And I believe it is an echo of, of every person who is wanting to live a godly life. The, m the closer we get to Christ, the more we understand God, and not least His attributes, the more we understand the holiness of God, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the love of God, the, the wisdom of God, uh, the more we realise the tremendous gap between God and us. This, this, this otherness of God that um, theologians speak about. Um, God is not like us. And, and Jesus Christ is not like us in that, in, in, in that way. Um, you know, we are, we are not um, uh, like Christ in, uh, in, in, in his um, attributes, in his character. Um, he is other than us. And our, our um, goal is to be uh, conformed to the image of Christ, to, to grow up and become more and more like Jesus Christ. But as Paul saw, as Peter saw when he said, um, um, go away from me, because I am a sinful man. As we see, the more we desire God, the more we study Him, the more we study His attributes, um, the more we cry with Paul, O oh, wretched man that I am. The more we cry, I'm the least of the apostles. Because it is this, this otherness of God that needs to be preached to balance up the intimacy that we have with God. The intimacy of worship. Uh, the privilege of being sons 
and heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We need to balance that up with the otherness of God. Otherwise, we will fall into the trap that many of the churches today are falling in and, and into, and many of the mega churches are falling into it, of teaching and preaching that basically Jesus is no different to us. He's beyond we we, we are we are we are blessed and, and basically Jesus is no different to us. But Paul saw that difference. But he lived in this, this tension of, uh, of being an apostle, of even rebuking Peter when uh, he went back on his uh, on, on, on his uh, revelation of uh, of uh, that the, the no foods any any longer were to be called unclean. Um, and Paul rebuked him to his face when he went back on that. And then Paul says to the church, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this greeting and, and, and these, these two wonderful um, blessed words, grace and peace, they go together so often. And it is, um, it is these two words that, that belong together. Because in Ephesians 2 verse 8 it says that we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it is nothing to do with us. It's not our works, it's not our goodness, it's not our talents, it's not uh, any, any good that is to be found in us. Uh, we are saved purely and absolutely by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. We repent of our sins and we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we understand what that grace means, when we understand how we have been lifted, when we understand what it is to be a child of God, what it is to be a son of God, adopted into the family of God, and blessed with all spiritual blessings, and otherwise everything that heaven has to offer us in this life is available to us. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. And it is that that gives us peace. It gives us a peace that the world would kill for. That was probably their attitude, isn't it? But, but you know, it, 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 it gives us a peace that, that, that many, many people would would pay a fortune to receive. Because we lay down, and I hope you do, on your bed at night, and you just lie there with that peace of God, knowing that you are a child of God. There are millionaires, and probably billionaires, who lay down every, every night, and, 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 and they don't even want to think about eternity. I think the Christian should not want to think anything but eternity. I don't think it's, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, saying that we, we, we just bumble through this life with, with, with no money in our pocket and, you know, and, and no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. We make plans and, 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 and we get an education and, you know, I, I, I study sometimes five or six hours a day and, and I, I love it. You know, I wouldn't do... Any, anything else. It doesn't mean that we, we just, you know, uh, almost give up and we're so heavenly minded we know earthly good. But when we lay down, before we go to sleep at night, we have a peace that nobody outside of Christ can have. They can't have that peace. I, some of you know, many, many years ago I, was, um, I worked in London and I'm sitting in a train on my way back to London, uh, from London, on my way back home. It's about um, getting on to seven o'clock at night because uh, it was a good hour and a half journey each way and sometimes I you know, um, had quite a responsible job and I wouldn't just leave at five, sometimes I'd work till six and, and then leave. leave. And I'm, sit I'm just sitting in the railway carriage um, and uh, um, I remember where I was sitting, I'm back to the engine, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about nothing. You know, I'm really tired, you know. And when you, you see people, every London you see people coming home from work, 
how that deal for some and this old that they all has a and they nod and they sort of get a bit embarrassed, you know, but the odds you know, and then, you know, there was that, that embarrassment, I mean, we've all had it, that embarrassed moment that, you know, you've nodded off and your head's gone down, and, you know, and, uh, and you, you look. Uh, but they're not, because they're, they're nodding off as well, or they're reading the newspaper, and I was in the car carriage, and I'm just, I was thinking nothing thoughts, really, I'm tired, and just suddenly, I just thought, and I'm not going to say it was the Holy Spirit that, put it there, but I think it was, and, and the thought came to me, you're saved, you're saved, and I tell you what, it's a good job that I am an Englishman, you know, because we, we're not emotional, um, and, and so I'm sitting, and in my, in my heart, and in my stomach, and in my whole being, I am rejoicing with all with all the spiritual blessing, because I'm just sitting there and suddenly you're, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. And there was such a joy, there was such a peace, there was, a, there was a, such a, a, a wonder about the grace of God that, that, that I'm saved. And, and, and um, it, it, was, you know, it was no particular reason, there was no, no earthly reason why I should have felt like that. But as soon as I realised that I was saved, I was just... Full of joy, so much. I just wanted to to explode. Well, I'm English, so I didn't. But uh, but uh, it was you know it, it was just knowing this peace, grace and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants you to have peace in your heart. God doesn't want you to always be worried and. And, and, and stressed and, and, and uh, especially when we are laying down at night you know we should we should be be at peace and we should remember the psalmist who said the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps there was a man who he was a Christian but he was so worried about what tomorrow would were bring and so worried about this that and the other and he had real problems sleeping until one evening he read that psalm and uh, he read that um, the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And, and um, he was a little bit of a special kind of person. And he just said to God, well, there's no, there's no, um, no sense in both of us are sleeping, uh, 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 staying awake, so I'm just going to go to sleep. The God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So God's away. God's watching over you so um, we, can, we can sleep. In, in peace. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in, in Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that we, we go up to heaven. What it means is that every spiritual blessing from heaven becomes the availability and, I might say, the property of the believer. Every spiritual blessing, love, joy, peace, um, patience, kindness, they become our property. Joy becomes our property. The ability to, to worship God, the ability to praise God, it becomes our ability. And God wants to bless us with every spiritual blessing. And he wants us to be joyful. He wants us to be at peace and he wants us to praise him. Now I don't have the worst singing voice in the world, but unfortunately I don't have the best singing voice in the world, so I can never earn any money at it. I'm one of these middle middle guys, you know, I, I can I can hold a tune, I can hold a note. Um, but um, if it's too if it's too high, then I'm in trouble, and uh, you know I'm, I I can't hit the, the high notes. But uh, no, we never sang in in, in in our house, so I never sang, and I was quite bound by it. So when I used to go to church with with, with Marilyn before I got saved, and then after I got saved, when everybody is singing the hymns, I would only mine them, I would mouth them, but I, I couldn't sing the hymns, neither could I weep, I couldn't sing and I couldn't weep, I hadn't, I think the last time I had actually shed a tear was when I was 15 years of age 
and they were tears of absolute frustration. <laughs> they were they were not tears of of, uh, of joy or, or tears of anything else. They were just tears of absolute frustration. And I couldn't weep, and I couldn't sing. I was kind of bound in my emotions. And then one day, and I can't remember the exact day it was, but it would have been in the early 70s, um, and, um, or mid-70s. Mid, mid and I had an experience of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit really washed over me. And it was a very, very, it was a very, very precious and very, very painful moment. But from that moment on, the next meeting I went to, I sang. I can actually now sing with my wife. You know, we can sing a, a duet together. I can sing. And uh, I had to be set free to be able to sing. The only problem is that the same moment that God set me free to sing, God set me free to weep. And um, that, I feel, um, is a little bit more difficult, you know, um, because when, when God sets you free, He sets you free to quite some degree. I'm not about to say totally free, but I don't think any of us are totally free yet. We will be. But God will set us free so He can bless us with every spiritual blessing. I found I could weep. I found out, you know, I found that I could, I could shed tears. Um, the problem is, you know, um, I'm, I'm, you know, watching a movie and, you know, I've got, I've got something in my eye, you know. Um, it, you, know it, it, you get set too free. But, but the, thing, the, the point I'm making is that God wants to bless us with every spiritual blessing. He doesn't want to bless us to, to the degree that... But I can't sing. I'm not blessed enough that I can sing. Or I can't weep. I'm not blessed enough that I can weep. He wants to bless us in every area of our lives. And sometimes he'll set us free from an area where we're really not being blessed. Sometimes he will set us free to be joyful in the Lord. Sometimes, you know, we need to be set free. Especially if um, we are... Um, of the reformed faith, and especially if we, you know, are really preaching a, a, a doctrine of repentance and, and, and holiness and, and separation from the world, there is a danger of being so taken up with our doctrines and so afraid of uh, doing something that uh, is um, of the world that we, we, we don't have the joy. And, and when we preach, there's no joy. And when we teach, that well, not no joy, but you, you understand what I'm saying. There's little joy. And, you know, we, we um, on Friday, had a, I think, wonderful Bible study. I'm sad to wonderful, not because I did it, but because Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, it's one of his. And I, I just, I just, till I see it, you know, I, I just made it my own by adding my own. But basically, the, the doctrine was, was from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And somewhere in the... Um, late 70s, he had a, a real experience with God because he'd been going through the book of Romans and uh, verse by verse on a Friday evening. So, Friday evening, you'll get Romans 1, verse 1, you'll get that's what you'll get in the Holy, and he would open that up. I mean, that was that's what he could do, he could open up a verse of scripture and teach it for an hour, an hour and a quarter, 50 minutes to 2,000 people on a Friday evening. But he, he said that one evening, um, I think God said to him, that um, you haven't got the joy that, is, that I want you to have when you are teaching from this book. And, and, and Lloyd Jones became very convicted that um, he was not, he didn't have that joy that spiritual blessing of joy. And uh, it changed his ministry. And uh, from, from that moment, uh, he really made sure that uh, he lived a life not just of truth, not just of doctrinal um, excellence, but of spiritual joy. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as... He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. 
And as I say, this is a wonderful verse. It is a verse that you, if you are a, a Christian, if you are a born again Christian, you should make this verse your own. If ever you feel that you are inadequate, if ever you feel that you are not important, if ever you feel that you don't really match, if ever you are looking at other people and thinking how great they are and, 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 and how, how good they are, remember that He chose you before the foundation of the world, before He made a planet, before He created a blade of grass, before anything was made, He chose us, He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. And that is a wonderful, wonderful truth. We are chosen. Paul was chosen. And I, I believe that uh, one of the reasons he could teach this and preach this was that uh, we, we speak about a Damascus Road experience. He had the Damascus Road experience. Where from being a persecutor of the church and a hater of Christ and a hater of Christians, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit of God, stopped him, <laughs> slammed him into the, the earth. And he had this experience. And he knew from that moment that he was chosen in Christ. And, um, you know, it was his testimony that, that, that I was a persecutor of the faith. And now, here is Paul, eventually giving his life for the faith. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of all. You don't need to um, know all the ins and outs of the doctrine of election because none of us do. It is a mystery in God. And uh, as, as Lord John so very, very uh, well puts, um, we are not to go further than what Scripture tells us. And scripture just tells us that we are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Um, it doesn't really um, tell us much more than that. But it tells us enough to be joyful. It tells us enough to have peace in our hearts. It tells us enough to know that we are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Why? He says, not just all oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord, that we should be holy, that we should be set apart, <clears throat> that we should be living a life that is different to the life we did before, and it is different from the life that the world lives. He has chosen us that we should be holy. And so it should be one of the major desires of our life to be holy, to live holy lives. I, I think that holiness is probably the doctrine that has underpinned, it's been our foundational doctrine over the last four years when we began to take a major change in the direction of this church. Not because... I, I preach that you should be holy. Not because I, I preach it, because I know that I am as worse a sinner as anybody in this church. I preach it, I teach it. It's a foundation of the, uh, the church here because it doesn't say that uh, Paul said, it says that we should be holy and without blame before him. God has called us to be holy. Just as He chose us in Him, before, as in Christ, before the foundation of the Lord, that we should be holy. So God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, not just to have fun, not just to have joy, although, as I've said, it is very, very important, but that we should be holy. And that doesn't mean that we keep uh, your a thousand rules or six thousand rules. Um, I was asked uh, fairly recently, just a few months ago, you know, what are the rules in this church? And and uh, and it was somebody that had been in the Jehovah's Witnesses and and, and a couple of other of um, of uh, uh, of the the faiths that, that preach a, a lot of rules. And uh, and I wrote back and I said, well, basically, we don't have any rules in. <laughs> 
in, in Trondheim International Church. We, we have a couple of conditions for membership, um, a testimony of salvation and being baptised um, after you come to faith. But we don't really have rules. You know, we don't say, uh, well, you know, you, 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 you can't eat brown cheese, or you, you can't do this, or you can't do that, or you can't play sport, or you can't watch sport, or you mustn't listen to music other than hymns and, uh, and worship songs. We don't have rules. What we have is this book. And we have two commandments. That Jesus, did, he just took the whole law and put it into two commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I really love myself, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean and now I'm going to love you as much as I love myself. You know, that is enough. We don't need any more rules. Just to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, giving everything to God. And then loving one another as, as we love ourselves. I mean, I mean the, the word says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. We have, we have hard enough trouble loving our own wives in, in that way without adding the whole church and, 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 the, and the whole of Christianity. So, we don't need rules. It's hard enough as it is. Uh, you know, we don't need food, food rules or, or other rules. Just to love God with everything that we have and to want to worship God with everything that we have and then to love one another as we love ourselves. Um, they, that's enough rules. We don't need to add any more rules in TIC. We're chosen to be holy. We're chosen to be holy and blameless, without blame. It means innocent. That's, I, I love that. I, I, I love that. You know, I do not believe in perfect holiness. I do not believe in, in, in you know, absolute uh, uh, conse consecration where we, we never sin and we never think a bad thought or, or, or say a bad word or, or do a, a, a bad deed. But blameless, innocent. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm not perfect. I'm not complete. But I'm innocent. I'm innocent of slander. I'm innocent of, of revenge. I'm innocent of, of envy. Being blameless. It, it's very, very hard. But to, to be blameless and to want to be blameless Blameless people, innocent people, they are such a blessing. You know, I, I, I know people, you never ever hear them say a bad word about anyone. And, and, and you, you're with them for years and, and you, you're, you're looking for that, you know, you're, 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 at least they know I feel a little bit better, you know. But, but no, they, they, they're, just, they're just the blameless lives. They just live innocent lives. And, 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 and I think. They should be attractive to the point of, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. I mean, I want to be like Christ, but that, that's too, too high. I'm still trying to be like my pastor in the church that I got saved in all those years ago. I'll settle for that. I'll settle for that. Now, I'm sure he wasn't perfect, and I'm sure his, his wife has just reached 100 years of, of age, but I'm sure if his wife was able to speak about her husband, she would be able to tell me about all, all his imperfections. But they, it wouldn't it wouldn't change me. It wouldn't change me. I want to be like that man. You know, Ephesians, this was his favourite book. I used to visit him and uh, and, and uh, I'd, I'd visit him in his study and there he'd be with his Bible down and I'd say, Oh Robin, oh, I'm reading Ephesians and he and, and he and he'd be preaching a sermon for about forty five minutes. His wife would come in with some coffee and and, 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 and gently remind him that uh, you know uh, that I hadn't got a word in Edgeway, so before you had me, I had him. And, uh, and, but, but it was a wonderful experience as he was, uh, you know, as he was so overjoyed, so joyful with, uh, with, 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 with the Word of God, with his life, with, 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 with everything. And he was blameless. I still want to be like him. We're chosen to be holy, we're chosen to be blameless. And then in 
Verse 5, having predestined us, again, a bit chosen, you see, predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. I mean, this is just a hymn of absolute praise. He has chosen you, he has predestined you to be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ. In other words, adopted into his family. And when we study sonship, and we, we did adoption a few weeks ago, so I can't really, I'd love to do adoption again tonight, but I won't, I won't do it. Except to say that it is a wonderful thing to be adopted into the family of God. Because this lifts us to something that uh, we will really not experience and not understand until we have our glorified bodies and we are with Christ in heaven. Because the word of God says that he couldn't do anything else but to bless us with all things together with Christ. That God has blessed us in the same way that he's blessed his own son. And it's a wonderful, wonderful truth. And we really want to discover the glory of this truth until we are in heaven. We will be glorified. We will have glorified bodies in heaven. But we are predestined to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. And that is enough for us now. God has chosen you to be his own child. A child of God. By or through the death of Christ on the cross. This is why Paul loves the cross of Christ. This is why Paul said, I don't want to know anything except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I am crucified with Christ. He preached the cross. He taught the cross. He loved the cross. Not because of the, uh, just, just, not just because of the sufferings of the cross, but because of what the cross means to us. We are children of God. We receive adoption through Jesus Christ. And he's made us accepted in the beloved. Again, we need to underline that. We are accepted in the beloved. Some of us don't have a problem there. We, we've always felt um, accepted wherever we've gone. We've been uh, you know, we'd be very popular and went well in school and it went well in the workplace. And, and we always kind of, and we take acceptance almost for granted. You know, we, we kind of, um, we, we're used to, to being accepted. But there are other people who are not used to being accepted. With their brothers and sisters, they were always the odd one out. In, in school, in class, they were the odd one out. And somehow, they weren't accepted. But all that is totally insignificant. Because we are accepted in the beloved. God has accepted us in Christ. And you are accepted. You are good enough. Okay, you are a wretched sinner. But you are good enough through the cross of Jesus Christ. And we are accepted in the beloved. Never feel uh, um, you know, sat, set to one, one side. Never feel you don't fit in. Never feel you don't count. Because I tell you, it's more important to be accepted by God in Jesus Christ and nobody else in this world than to be accepted by everybody else in this world and yet not by God in Jesus Christ. If we are accepted by the beloved, we are accepted in the one person who counts. And that is Jesus Christ and God our Father. We are accepted in the beloved. Lift up your head because you are accepted. Lift up your heart because you are accepted. Because God's word tells us so. He made us God made us, Christ made us accepted in the beloved. And it took the sufferings and the painful death and the terrible uh, bearing of our sin in order to do that. And so to be accepted in God is a tremendous privilege. It's a tremendous privilege. 
accepted in the blood. We're predestined to adoption as sons by Jesus, accepted in the beloved. And the reason is plain, it's according to the good pleasure of his will. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus, according to the good pleasure of his will. The will of God is wonderful. All these blessings, all this glory, all the wonderful riches that we read about in Ephesians is simply because of the good pleasure of his will. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, now it isn't just that, that, that you know, we need to be careful because God is absolutely sovereign. But in this sovereignty, there is love. In this sovereignty, there is care. In this sovereignty, there is forgiveness. In this sovereignty, there is joy. And there is, there is spiritual blessings that are, are indescribable. We'll get to that uh, probably in a few weeks' time when we come to um, that wonderful uh, 3 a. To me, says Paul, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And we have unsearchable riches of Christ. We are accepted in God. And it's all according to this wonderful will, this wonderful sovereignty, this wonderful good pleasure of God. We are no longer enemies. We're no longer to be afraid of God in that way. Our fear of God now is an awe. It's, it's this, this, this understanding of how come this otherness, how come this, this almighty and, and, and absolute being called God, how can he accept me and love me and even die for me? It is a, an amazing truth. We are accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in Christ. Now we had a great question because it, on Friday it comes up a lot. Now, you know, it's about being accepted in God and being blessed with all spiritual blessing. And the question that comes up many times is, um, can a Christian lose their salvation? Can I lose my salvation? Can you lose your salvation? And there are different, uh, there are different um, schools of thought on this, and and they're, and they're good. You know, they are they're good. I mean, I'm not saying that one is right and the other is wrong. It depends on your, uh, I think it depends on, uh, on, on your teaching. It depends how you, how you see the Bible. And so, uh, you know, there, there is the reformed faith of, of which I, I, you know, we tend to be in this church, which basically says that uh, we are kept by the power of God, that basically says that, um, that we don't have to worry about losing our salvation the way we have the assurance of our salvation. Fanny Cosby wrote a wonderful hymn called Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of, of glory divine. And uh, I tend to believe that. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I have the assurance of my salvation. And when I bring anybody to Christ in this church or any other church, the first thing I want to do is to assure them of their salvation. And that is one of the reasons I do not preach an easy gospel. That is one of the reasons why I do not say, come to Jesus and have a better life. Come to Jesus and he'll repair this. Come to Jesus and heal this. Come to Jesus and he'll do that. Because I want to make sure that when you come to Christ, you're coming for the right reason. You are a wretched, absolute sinner who needs to repent, needs to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you do that with all your heart, you, I believe, will never, ever depart from God. But there are equally good Christians that believe that uh, you're a Christian, can be saved, and then we can actually lose our salvation. And we were talking on, on Friday about this, and uh, one of the things we said was, well, well what, is the, what is the pass mark for this? <laughs> you know, uh, all right, if I can lose my salvation, do, do I lose it because I'm watching the wrong movie? You know, or, or do I do it because I said, oh, that word that I shouldn't ever say. Do I, do, do I say it because um, I told five lies? No, maybe it's ten. Maybe the past month actually is ten, so I'm okay, I've only told five lies. You know, the, the, you know, how do I know when I lose my salvation? Or how do I know that I haven't lost my salvation? But these are, you know, both these views can, can go to Scripture and find Scriptures that seem to support it. 
So, can I lose my salvation? Well, I can only give advice. My first advice is, don't live with the attitude of how much of the world can I have in my life and still be a Christian? That I do not advise that. I do not advise you to say, well, I don't want to lose my salvation. I really, I, I, oh, I'm really afraid that, that when I stand in front of God, when I stand in front of Jesus, he will, he will say, I never knew you. Um, mm, but I wonder how much of the world I can actually have in my life. I wonder how much I can actually do and, and, you know, and, and enjoy this world. Hey, still be a Christian. You know, I, I, want, I want insurance. I want, to, I want the Christian insurance. You know. But how much of a good time can I have? I don't advise that if you want the assurance of your salvation. That doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. I believe that when we love God, we want to please God all the time. We don't want to sin, but when we do sin, we know we have an advocate with the Father. We know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So I can't really answer that question. I can only give you my view on it. And my view on it is that if you come to Christ the correct way, which is through a deep repentance or through some repentance and putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and you really mean it, then the first thing I'm going to look for is some transformation in your life. You know, that's what I look for as a pastor. I look for some transformation in your life. In the way you live, in the way you talk, in, in the way you think, in the way you love God's word, in the way that you want to go on with God, in your hunger and your thirst after God that we, we, we spoke about last week. I look for some change, some transformation in your life. And I honestly believe that if we live our lives and we have been born again and really repented, received Christ as, as our Saviour, and we want to live... Um, upright, innocent, holy lives, not being perfect, not pretending to be perfect, but really wanting to give glory to God. Um, and we continue that through our life. We do not, I believe, have to worry. We will receive, well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your rest. Enter into the kingdom. Enter into heaven. Because, you see, there's, there's no pass mark with works. Works didn't have anything to do with your salvation or my salvation. That grace of God and that grace upon grace upon grace will be with us until our final moment. It's all by grace. By grace you have been saved. By grace you will be kept. And it's because of His grace that we've been accepted in the beloved. Remember you're accepted. And we have in verse 7 redemption through his blood, through this precious blood of Jesus. We have a wonderful redemption. I'll go um, through, through this very very quickly. We have the we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins in verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And it's toward us. His grace towards us. Which he, in verse 8, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. God has made his grace in Jesus Christ abound toward us. God is towards us. God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? It says in Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? And God is toward us. God is for us. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. You see, there are thousands and millions of people. Um, if they were listening this evening, they would, it would be a mystery. What is he on about? What is he talking about? But to, to us, 
It has been given by God to understand and to respond. He has known, made known to us the mystery of His will. I mean, this is the will of God. You know, this, this, is, this is God who, who you can, can you know, who hears and, 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 and understands every thought and every word simultaneously from every person on the face of this earth. And yet he has made known to us the mystery of his will. And his will is that all shall come to him and be saved. But he has made known to us. It has become a reality in our lives. It's not, it's not words on paper. It's not words in the book. But it is words that are written on our hearts. He has made known to us this wonderful mystery. And in verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We have an inheritance. God has laid up, first of all, treasures on this earth where he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, promised to meet all our needs, promised to never leave us and never forsake us, a promise to shine his light on us every day that we live. But he has riches stored up for us, an inheritance stored up for us that he simply couldn't even explain to us today. It's our inheritance that's laid up in heaven. So we have we have riches now. We have an inheritance now that we are basically you know spending. Although you know there's there's never any end to it. But we have this this inheritance in heaven predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He's working all things through the counsel of his will. All things work together for good for those that love Christ, for those that are called according to his purpose. So when we're in a tight spot and it doesn't look very good, uh, and, and I'm, I'm as big a sinner as anybody, I'm as big a doubter as anybody, I'm a, as big a... a discouragement as anybody. When I'm in these difficult times, when difficult times uh, come to me, I probably won't be preaching this the, the way I'm preaching it tonight. But one thing I do know, that even when I come into those difficult positions, even when I come into difficult circumstances, even when things in life go totally against what I, I, I expected them to do and how I wanted them to do, I know that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And it's a wonderful thing. You see, someone said on a Friday, brilliant, uh, uh, we're a work in progress. I love that. We're a work in progress. You see, you know, if someone criticises you, or, 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 or you would never do this, but you know, or you criticise me, I say, God's not finished with me. <laughs> I'm a work in progress. God's not finished with me. He's knocking on those those edges. We, we spoke about them, we saw about the potter and, and the clay, you know, and, 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 and he's still working, he's still moulding me. And uh, maybe that that area of weakness, I mean, maybe he's gonna maybe he's gonna work on that and, 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 and help me. We are to the praise of his good glory in verse 12. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. God has made you to the praise of his glory. The chief end of man is that we should glorify God and enjoy him forever. Westminster Catechism. One of the first on the West, written brilliantly in 1647. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We can enjoy God. The you know, the reformers enjoy God forever. That's our end. We will enjoy God forever. That's our chief end. We can enjoy God forever. We're to the praise of His glory. Verse 13, we trusted in Christ after we heard the word of truth, the gospel, the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. In him you also trusted 
after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. There comes a point in every believer's life when we finally hear that word of power, that word of salvation, that word of the gospel that transforms us. And sometimes it's after years of searching. Sometimes we've, we've looked in all what we hope were the right places, but they were all the wrong places. I looked everywhere, everywhere from sport to, to music to poetry to, to left-wing politics, you, you name it, and I, I was searching. And then came that night when the gospel was preached, when God graciously and sovereignly by his Holy Spirit sealed in me my salvation. And when you become a Christian, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Wonderful. We, have, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God has promises for you. God has promises for me. And he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? See, that's a, another thing I believe about um, having the assurance of our salvation. He is our guarantee. Not our works, not our lack of works, not our good things, not our bad things, but He Himself is the guarantee of our salvation. The guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Until we receive the fullness of our salvation. Until we leave this life and enter into what is really our life, which is eternity. See, I, I, think, I think salvation is an amazing thing. I actually enjoy my life here. It is not perfect. I am not perfect. Not every day is a perfect day. But I actually enjoy my life here. But God tells me that it is nothing compared to what God has stored up for us. Our redemption is drawing nigh. We are redeemed. We shall be redeemed. We are saved. We shall be completely saved. We have a joy and a peace and, and, and a love in our hearts now. But we shall have a perfect joy, a perfect love, a perfect peace when we are changed into his likeness. And he knows everything about us. And I know so little about him. But he has promised me that one day I will see him and I will know him as he knows me. One day we will see him and we will know him as he knows us. Paul says that for the time being, it's like looking in a, in a glass darkly. You know, we, we don't see everything as it is. But God has revealed enough of his word, enough of his grace, enough of his love, that we will be kept by the power of God until that day when we enter into his glory and our glory. Father, we just thank you for your love, your goodness to us at all times, Lord. We thank you for the book of Ephesians, Lord, and the glory that you have revealed to us, which is the glory of the church. Help us to see, Lord, that TRC is a glory. That the glory of the church is found in every local assembly as it is found in the universal church. I pray that you will bless, encourage hearts, Lord, and that, Lord, if we came here this evening with our hearts a little bit down, or, uh, Lord, I, I pray that by your word and by the sealing of your Holy Spirit, you will lift us up to higher planes. You will lift us up to a highway, Lord, which goes over every difficulty and every problem in our earthly life. And, Lord, as we go on, we thank you, Lord, that Paul did the same. Not that he had arrived, but he pressed on 
to receive that price. He pressed on to the mark, Lord, and we are doing the same. And Lord, we believe that each and every one of us, Lord, as we honour you and encourage one another on the day that we meet with you, that every soul in TIC will hear that wonderful greeting, that wonderful homecoming. Welcome, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.